Oh, sorry. Over to you again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, you're not saying good morning back because you all have our newt, of course, uh, and this is uh, how it works these days. Um, I just want to start by thanking um, Sid and Horvar and Devin for uh, for organizing this course. I mean, it's brilliantly organized. It's extremely complex. You know, this is the work of geographers, clearly, not anthropologists as myself. So it is uh, interlaced and transversal, and it's... Uh, all things good so thank you very much it's also a great lecture to have someone summarize the readings before you so thank you Devin for that uh, you've done it much more succinctly than I will I think but I hope we still will have some fun today and by fun I mean intellectual fun so I'm very happy to see well the uh, faces of some of you, and I look forward to discussing with you. Uh, my name is Björn Enge Bertelsen. I'm a professor of social anthropology. I've been affiliated with the Department of Social Anthropology for, um, well, 20 years or so. And what I want to do today is to start by first talking through some of the material on the reading list and some of the perspectives in that. Uh, emphasizing, uh, not surprisingly, my own work, uh, also, but also trying to make connections to the work of uh, Teresa Caldera and uh, also uh, Tulumelo. And thereafter, I hope we can spend around, uh, yeah, 15, 20 minutes, hopefully, discussing this. And I really want your intellectual, critical, input on this yeah i want you to critically engage these thoughts and i hope i hope some of it, it will be provocative for you as well this is my hope anyway all right okay and now i'm supposed to put the share screen on let's so see if that works uh, does this work for everyone Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Yeah. So this is my. <laughs> so this is my, my name. Uh, and I just wanted to start with this. This is the classic cliche image of the world. Yeah. And I'm. I apologize for showing it to you in a sense, but it underlines a few very important things. For one, the world is becoming urban at a fast rate. Yeah. The light spreads everywhere, so there is no longer any non-urban place you could say yeah? at least that's a statement that can be made but delighting is somehow misleading it leads us to think that we know in a sense what the city is the city is a lighted form of grid and this is similar everywhere and my job of course is as an anthropologist and as someone who's been working in the global south since 1998 is to try to in a sense, move beyond this, what we could call the radiation of similarity of cities, in a sense. Yeah. Because I think we stand a lot to gain from appreciating what we could call non-morphological or non-formal approaches to cities. And we stand a lot to gain from that if we want to engage and change those cities in a sense so we need to understand uniqueness of cities and we need to understand um, the central dynamics going on in those cities yeah. and i want to start with the place that i have done field work in for the longest part of my research was which is a a medium-sized town of 300,000 in central Mozambique, Chimoyo. And as I hope you can see on your screen, and I hope you don't have sort of the mobile phone version of this uh, lecture because then it will be very hard, but I hope you have a decent screen. Then you will see that in the, in the middle here, do you, see, do you see the mouse as well when I do like this? Yeah, very good. This is what we think of as the, the city normally. Yeah? This is the quadrature. This is the organized grid yeah while the real city the city that, that actually 95 
percent of the people live in is this yeah okay so if we want to think about who accelerates situated urban transformations and how which is one of the central causes of this of, of uh, central questions of this theme we have to take in the whole city yeah not just focusing on the on the grid grid the ideal city the idea of the polis from the greeks etc etc but the whole city this thing and the situation is quite similar for maputo that i have also written about uh here you see this is the what we think about as the the formal grid while the city the real city stretches like this yeah uh in these cities in mozambique um it is not just a question of formal and informal yeah so we need to move beyond the question of the formal and informal because this is still within a kind of a topological or or formal space approach we also need to think about what these spaces mean yeah and in Mozambique, what I've been trying to show in some of my articles is that certain aspects of these spaces are connected with wealth, yeah, which is quite obvious, you know, I mean, we all, we all see it when we travel around. Some areas look more wealthy than others, but also some areas are connected to the state, yeah. So the state, the notion of a state order, the notion of state power needs to be, needs to be brought in. Okay. And, and uh, okay, I heard someone's someone's microphone is on, but I it's off again now. So, in in the overview that we see here, the state spaces con are are, um, are the same as the the spaces of wealth in a sense. These are the state spaces, yeah. But the state space is also, for instance, the airport. It's the roundabouts like here it's the bridges that you see here built by the chinese of course and i don't have really any time to go into this very very deeply here but in uh, places like maputo politics overcode space as well this is a one party state effectively yeah it's formally a democracy but it's a one party state and on this bus stop, it's written, este espacio es seu, this space is yours, yeah? Which is sort of a, a, a small flicker of the free market and neoliberalism in a sense, in a sea of overcoding by the one party state, yeah? So this is a quite an important context to understand uh the the uh, the uprisings in a in a sense and why is it important it's important because the majority of people in a country like mozambique like in many southern urban contexts read spaces and urban spaces deeply politically yeah? okay okay this is another image from Maputo. Uh, it is an image taken by the Mozambican photographer Sergio Costa. And it's from uprisings on the 1st and 2nd of September 2010. And I used it with kind permission from him. I bought the use rights for this photo. So this is not a, uh, an example of a wealthy northern uh, researcher who has appropriated the intellectual labor from someone from the global south, just to underline that point. And how can we understand that image? Yeah? Uh, what is it part of? What does it mean that the boy is wearing a policeman's hat? Because he has actually appropriated a policeman's hat. Yeah? And what does it have to do with politics and power, in a sense? Uh, can we see this as a form of resistance, which is a type of template explanation that is sometimes used if there is trouble in cities and trouble elsewhere? And can the kind of uprisings that we saw in, uh, in um, Maputo, can they be seen as a reaction against neoliberalism? Yeah. 
this also template explanation. It's like a template boogeyman, you know, that we bring into all kinds of contexts. And then, then we say, well, this happens because of neoliberalism. Is it, another explanation we could come up with is, is this a desire for a stronger and more present state? Yeah? Is this young guy stealing this policeman's hat, putting it on because he wants a more present state? active state, perhaps a more benevolent state? Or is it just an apolitical expression for a wish for material goods and money? In a sense, yeah. And I mentioned these questions to you because these were questions I struggled with when I tried to come to terms with these, uh, these, uh, these uprisings that I've been trying to describe in several pieces, actually, not just the piece you have on, on uh, on the curriculum, but also another piece that came out in a book on sort of reflections on fieldwork and recurring fieldwork. But okay, the start of the uprisings was simple enough. Yeah, as you know, it was organized through cell phones and SMSs. Uh, it was what we in anthropol anthropology called a cephalus, which means without a head. It was without a leader. Yeah. There was no formal organization behind this. No formal organization. It was highly mobile and dynamic. So it moved from place to place, from space to space. And this is why I used the notion of the rhizome, yeah, to, to try to capture the dynamic of this. A rhizome is a, a structure where every point can connect to any other point. Yeah? And if you destroy part of it, it doesn't destroy the whole. So it's not like a static network. It's a dynamic, always, uh, always uh, transforming network, if you will, or, or system of connectivity. Yeah? And of course, the internet has been uh, called a type of rhizomic network. And the, uh, but the best analogy, I think, and I will not go into this, but I mean, you can look it up, is the, the, uh, uh, the fungi, the mushrooms, yeah? and how, their, how their, uh, their root networks connect and interconnect and, and grow up again. So being a rhizomic kind of uprising with no leaders, no organization, it also meant that the state, when they tried to to, to repress this had no leaders to arrest. There were no one to arrest. Yeah? There were just people on the street and SMSs being sent around. And the absence of a political organization also meant that no one could be held accountable as it were. Yeah? Okay? However, there are of course also clear limits to, to the rhizomic form of, of power engaged in these types of, of uprisings. And that is that when the state, with the help of Vodacom and MCEL, the Mozambican uh, telecom company, shut down the cell phones, cell phone network, which, which they did for two days, the whole, <laughs> the whole dynamic of, of the uprising uh, uh, also died down in a sense. Yeah? And it also meant that when the uprisings uh, die down after a, after a few days, it loses its power. Yeah, it it gets easily co-opted into hegemonic forms of politics and and discourses. So I wanted to underline this because this is another type of organization of politics than for instance, the state form of power on the NGO, or the NGO form of power or the, or the form of power of political parties. Yeah? This is not what we normally talk about when we talk about collectivities. Yeah? But this is a very strong and assertive form of politics in cities in the global south, I would like to underline, and one that we should be mindful of when we talk about transformation. Okay. And it's important also because it, it deterritorializes the whole authority of the state. I mean, this, this, this uprising shut down the city of Maputo and other cities for two consecutive days, which meant that people were stranded in their areas. Now, the second element that I would like to mention is perhaps uh, uh, even stranger, and that is the notion of the uh, carnival and the grotesque. 
Central to this is that many who took part in the, these uprisings here and in many other places, they see these as big parties in a sense. Yeah? They see these as opportunities to transform the roles. They see these as the opportunities to engage in positions of power. Yeah? Think, think again about the boy with a policeman's hat. Yeah? Uh, so this perspective is informed very much by the work of the post-colonial theorist Achille Mbemba, the Cameroonian post-colonial theorist, who's worked a lot, of course, on Cameroon, but also much more broadly on, on the Global South and on politics in the Global South. And he underlines that we cannot really understand the situation in contexts like Cameroon, South Africa, Mozambique, other places as one of dichotomies yeah, of, of hegemons or of those in power and the repressed. Yeah? This, di this dichotomous kind of thinking doesn't really get us into the dynamics of politics or the way uh, subjectivities are formed or how people actually engage. Yeah? We need to see this also in the, in the, um, in the context of, uh, of, of uh, the grotesque and the carnival, which is sort of the playfulness of it all in a sense. So this also means that we do not necessarily, we cannot necessarily label these people who participated in the uprisings as proto-revolutionary agents in a sense. This is not necessarily class formation and early class formation uh, that people will then transform into being more organized and then becoming an NGO or a political party and then work towards some kind of meaningful transformation in our sense of the word, yeah? Okay. Okay. The third element, and I apologize here for this, uh, this silly image from the hippie era uh, that I put up here. I, I just found it very, very funny. This is the notion that, that Devin also uh, explained uh, a bit, effervescence. Yeah? It is from uh, Durkheim, as Devin uh, said. It, it, is, it alludes to the collectivity, collective emotional or affective, affective intensity. Yeah, that is usually, uh, we usually think about when thinking about um, rituals, for instance. But in my analysis, again, people were really emotional about this. Yeah? They were emotional about this. And they had a sense that something was opening. Yeah? They took over the city, a city that has been the, the purview of the big one-party state. They took over areas of the wealthy. They took back wealth yeah, by, by looting uh, shopping malls and, and, and uh, armacins, uh, uh, um, warehouses. So this is an important aspect that I think we should be mindful of. And there has been, as you all would know, an, an affective turn, a turn to the affect, both in geography and lots of other social sciences lately. So this is, of course, also related to that. And um, as Devin was alluding to in her work, the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations all across the world has also shown this, this force of, of the affective, in a sense, yeah? of affect, of emotions. Yeah? So this is uh, this is uh, this is very important, and of course also David Graeber, the famous uh, anarchist uh, anthropologist, has also talked about this: the joy of confronting the police, the joy of putting on masks, of becoming a collective, not being one, the joy of ha of feeling the the adrenaline rush through your body. Yeah? So this is something we should all also be mindful of. Okay, um, this is the fourth element. It's fleeting. This is the ephemeral nature of this. And it's enduring at the same time. And this has to do with time, yeah? temporality. When we think about protest, when we think about uh, collective action, this is not something that just happens and then 
unhappens, as it were. We have to think about this more deeply. We have to think about what type of traces are left within the urban space, within the mindsets of, of people, etc. So this is why I find it uh, useful to, to, to chop an event like an uprising into two, two types of time, if you will. One is the type of, of uh, chronos that we have from chronology, of course, which is the linear notion of time, yeah? where an uprising is a point in time. Yeah. This is the history as one go goddamn thing after the other, as uh, Hayden White once said, kind of a view of, of history. Yeah. But then there is the important bit, which is the ion. Yeah? I'm, I apologize for using coming up early in the morning with Greek terms, but I mean, I, 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 have, to, I have to use some terms for this, so I apologize. The ion is the enduring uh, aspect of time and the event, in a sense. Yeah? And this is, of course, important because uprisings like this, mass mobilizations like this, uh, are becoming part of collective memory. They also travel. Scripts like this travel around the globe. For instance, in my in in uh, Maputo in in uh, 2008 2010, they were especially in 2010. They were very happy to see that also white people uh, rioted in in London. You know, so they were very inspired by that. Not so it could also be white people, not just black people rioting. So these things travel, and they also become scripted, yeah. And you see this in 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 terms of how how riots and uh, and um, uh, are are co-opted in a sense. Okay, I just wanted to show a bit few quick images before just mentioning very briefly a few words on uh, on on caldera and tulumelo and also pointing very briefly at what type of peripheral urbanization we might see emerging on the horizon yeah that we should also be mindful of this is mafalala in maputo as you see this is this is these are very very uh, poor areas these are also areas, and this is something that uh, Caldera talks about, in peripheral urban areas like this, or areas with peripheral urbanization, there are also aspirations, yeah? And things emerge over time, yeah? So this is someone aspiring to build a two-story house in a, in a one-story uh, area, in a sense, yeah? These are also areas, I've written about this elsewhere, with lots of uh, different gang structures that are important to understand the, the social order of these spaces. These are also areas that are increasingly being shot through by incredible wealth. A lot of it derives from uh, heroin traffic, uh, drug traffic. And Maputo is the big uh, drug port from South Asia to Europe and the US. And a lot of it is invested in real estate. So this is also an important that we should, I will not talk too much about this there, I could, but I mean, we should also be uh, mindful of how, how and why cities and houses are built there. Yeah. And it's to, to sink down heroin capital also. Okay, lots of new wealth, uh, lots of not beautiful new wealth. Uh, and Caldera, she talks about this, the, the importance of seeing this over time, in a sense. Yeah? She's concerned with peripheral urbanization. And by that, she means that not urbanization in the periphery of a city center. Yeah? She, she urges us to move away from this kind of centric view of the city, as I do as well. But peripheral urbanization is the mode of the production of urban space yeah, that can happen anywhere within what we think of as a city. And she says that we should be mindful of that peripheral urbanization is a specific form of agency and temporality. We see this, and we saw this earlier today uh, on, on one of the earlier slides. People build houses over time, yeah? So we need to, we need to have the time element uh, with us when we look at this. And in her beautiful article, she has a 35-year photo sequence taken from the same terrace in Sao Paulo to show us exactly that. So we need to be 
mindful of that. This peripheral urbanization, which is the main driver of building cities in the global south, and we should be mindful of this. Uh, it's not the city hall that determines how the city becomes. It's not necessarily international global capital. It's people themselves to build cities. Yeah? So peripheral urbanization is the driver of cities in the global south. And they also have, often have these people who build houses themselves, auto construction. They often often have transversal engagement with official logics, yeah? which means that they negotiate with state agents. They try to appropriate state logics. Uh, the state also negotiates with them. This is not a straight formal uh, forward formal informal relation. Yeah, this is quite complex and dynamic. It also points to new forms of politics, she says, and new forms of insurgent citizenship. So it holds a lot of potential to look at peripheral urbanization in a sense. And one that has looked at peripheral urbanization that has become mature, if you will, that has sedimented or, or generated a more permanent structure is uh, Tulumelo. She's been looking at this in, in uh, Lisbon, and she has been looking at a place called Muraria in downtown Lisbon, a beautiful area. I recommend you all to go there at some, some point. Uh, and please note that all the examples uh, this, this morning is from uh, Lusophone areas of the world and by Lusophone speakers, that is Portuguese speakers. So there is a bit of a uh, bias uh, to this. Anyway, she follows the transformation of this area and how the template explanation, if you will, of neoliberalism as, as a transformation of this downtown area has certain limits. And this is, uh, this is, um, this is uh, to me, one of, one of the most important uh, uh, aspects of her, uh, of, her, of her work. She also cautions us to be careful with what types of template explanations or template understandings of the city we travel around with in the world. Because she says that the, the, uh, the scholarly critiques of neoliberalism that I guess many of us peddle around, I mean, this is also a form of hegemonic power that can cut off or prevent other understandings of the city, more local understandings of the city. And she shows that beautifully with the case of Lisbon, why that is important. Yeah? Why, for instance, a, a place like uh, Muraria um, has not had rampant, rampant gentrification despite neoliberal policies being, uh, being uh, included, for instance. Okay. Oh man, it's going too fast this, but I was just going to show you that this is perhaps the, um, the, new, um, the new things that we will see on the horizons, okay, on the, in the global south especially. We now have what we call enclave urbanism, yeah? Enclave urbanism, where you have tailor-made cities being built in the global south by huge companies, yeah? So if we talk about the city, yeah, what do we mean then? This is from Apollonia, a project that I've been following for a few years, built by Russian venture capital. This is meant to hold 100,000 people. It's being built as we speak. Uh, this is the City of God Church in Nigeria, holding around 500,000 people, 500,000 people. They're building their own city with uh, their own police force, banks, schools, uh, businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So when we, thought to, when we think about the city, what do we mean then? Yeah, in, in context like this. This is the Mormon city in Florida, uh, currently being planned. They bought the land, built by the Mormon church. They're going to build this and it's going to hold 500,000 people approximately, okay? So again, this is just to try to further explode the image of the city yeah? when we think about the urban in the global south and what kinds of dynamics of inequality 
uh, this might hold and also what kind of promise it holds for uh, engaging critically for transform for transformation and i think i'll i'll stop there okay sorry this was a bit rambling but i hope you got the point now we open the floor as it's a well digital floor uh, for questions and and comments i should stop sharing shouldn't i now so yeah so it's easier to see everyone Uh, may I start? Um, you, thank, you may. You thank you for the uh, very inspiring uh, presentation. Um, I was wondering, or um, this is a question on uh, Maputo and the um, state space that you've been talking about. And I was wondering if you uh, seen any um, changes uh, on, on the materiality of these state spaces due to the protests in Maputo. So you you said they they directly um, somehow pointed at these uh, infrastructures, for instance. And I was wondering if these uh, yeah uh, uprisings had any effect uh, on on these structures. Thank you, uh, Lucas. Um, a very interesting question. Uh, <sighs> It's yeah. I first I would like to say that I want I don't want to come across as sort of a, any type of uh, of Afro pessimist or any pessimist at all. I'm not a pessimist. Uh, I I like to think positively, and I currently work on also African notions of utopia. I work on uh, African um, alternatives, uh, African epistemologies, etc., etc., etc. I would like to say that first, yeah. But when, when, um, when you ask about sort of effects, you guess I allude to effects in terms of state accommodation or new types of, of state actions in response to or in engagement with the demands of the protesters, in a sense. And what the state did for Limo, and this is again uh, uh, the party in, in power in, in Mozambique, is that they, they, uh, they, they, they met the demands in a sense, yeah? uh, at a very sort of superficial level, they met the demands of the protesters. Yeah? So the protests came about as, as what, what some would call, um, well, it came about in a form of what some would call a bread riot, yeah, because there was an announced hike in prices of electricity, uh, in in flour for making bread, uh, transport, fuel, other things, yeah. And the state, after two days and after shutting down the cell phone network, um, went back on that announced price rise, yeah. So in a sense protesters won in 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 the short term yeah uh, in terms of long-term effects um there are now uh, plans in effect to to build a what the um what the, the mozambican city government calls a more resilient city yeah this this is the new buzzword in the global south as elsewhere as elsewhere resilient city and a resilient city in the context of Maputo also means that you should build a huge ring road around the city. And this is, of course, not bad, not only, uh, not only bad for sort of increased uh, traffic uh, and car traffic. This is a very car-centered kind of, of uh, place. But it's also a, uh, a, an infrastructure put in place to be resilient against protests. Yeah? The ring road is an infrastructure of anti-protest in a sense. Yeah. If you have a ring road, you can't really occupy city spaces anymore, or it's it's very, very hard to 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 do that. Yeah. So I would say it's a it's a it's a mixed it's a mixed bag. Yeah. What is important put oh sorry, I shouldn't be okay, there are many other questions as well, but I just want to mention one more thing, yeah. In terms of the protests having been co-opted by, by what you could say a civil society or NGOs or, or parties of opposition, there has been very little of that. Yeah? 
because there were precisely no leaders that stood forth in a sense there were no one to there were no one to co-opt and two days after the the uprisings ended in 2010 the main opposition party Renamo went out and said that we organized the uprisings and everyone laughed and they were not taken seriously because they clearly did they were not part of this yeah so this is something that happens outside the formal political structure in a sense sorry for the long answer Ah, may I? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, the talk. I found it very, very interesting. And um, this is a very specific question. Let me just, um, well, I, I have to elaborate, but first I will uh, phrase my question. Um, does the effectiveness of demonstrations and its effervescence have an expiration effect that's my question and i will elaborate uh, what i mean by that um i come from a country where social demonstration demonstrations are uh, currently a normal way of life this is our cities um, are have been striking by such social demonstrations for the past decades. And probably at least once a week, there is one kind of the social demonstrations that you just mentioned in, in Maputo. However, since the government started to pay every time less attention to it, the social violence started to increase. That means, it, uh, all demonstrations started to be specific. However, it kind of lo lost the effectiveness. That means government, government was not paying any more attention. It would only strike to the media for the day. But uh, since there was no solution, no, uh, I'm not talking about immediate solution, but not a, a short or medium uh, uh, time as solution, um this demonstration started to become more frequent so in order for the governments in order to make it to news in order to have this social power that we see now in the u.s for example they had to increase um they had to somehow affect society in other ways so every time they are becoming more violent to some degrees that um, I'm really ashamed of uh, mentioning. But um, in my opinion, I've been considering since it's been taken for such a long time and the governments are not paying any more attention and it just make uh, the, the news for the day. And even though it's hundreds of thousands of people going to the streets and causing major damage, not only to the urban, itself but now it's blocking uh, highways um, they coordinate with some other cities and they demonstrate in the same way but still we don't it, it seems to me there is not a reaction there is not the appropriate answer there is not a solution for the social concerns of the citizens governments are not paying any more attention so uh, uh, the phenomenon it increases and um, it's a concern of mine of how effective uh, are these demonstrations uh, with the time. Um, sorry if I had to uh, give probably more details than necessary in order to understand my question. Thank, thank you very much. Uh... Patricia. Patricia, yeah, yeah. I was going to say it, Patricia, but I, I, ju I just have to. Sorry, could I, could I just ask? Patricia, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, where, where are you from? I just have to. Mexico. Mexico. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I've been to Mexico. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful place. Um, Thank you. 
when no, there are no demonstrations <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i don't know i mean this is a this is the big question perhaps we can we can come back to this in our in our discussion about uh collectivities as well yeah okay what 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 produces a lasting collectivity yeah teresa caldera for instance in her work on on um on uh, peripheral urbanization she demonstrates i think that that uh, that in order for these peripheral urban i mean the urban poor the marginalized uh, to have effect there needs to be a conjunction of two different processes at the same time so she says there has to be a certain level of organizations of the citizens in the area, but you also have to have a responsive state, yeah? a state that is responsive, that is concerned with social justice, that has a willingness yeah, to, to engage these, uh, these matters. If not, it will not really be possible. And she shows... Uh, so she shows uh, this, I think, uh, quite quite well. And in Santiago, where you've had a lot of, of, of sort of social house building, for instance, and a lot of local organization, it worked well. And then Istanbul, where you've had r rampant neoliberal transformations uh, imposed by the government and neoliberalism, then in a certain uh, in a certain sense. Yeah. So. So she, she qualifies this in a, in, a, in a sense. But I mean, it's, it's a big answer. Uh, it's a big question as well. Will it have effect? Yeah? Will protests have effect? And this is what I also try to uh, hint to when I talk about the problem of scripting. Yeah? Because there is, there, is, there, is, there is a problem when all public protests look the same all across the world. Yeah? Uh, it is a problem not only because you then have transnational activists traveling around organizing uh, local protests as if they think they know what these are about. This is the anthropologist talking. Uh, but it also uh, is, of course, a problem because it will not... Uh, it will not have any uh, any effect in terms of getting media attention yeah? or or the media discourse around this because there is no newsworthiness to it. It, it. Everything happens repetitively, in a sense. Yeah, and in a sense, there is there is just uh, yeah, there is there is no one will remember if this was the protest from this week or last week, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, I don't have any I don't have any big conclusions to this. I mean, it's a difficult question. So what is what is effectiveness uh, in terms of protest? Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, I'm interested in this concept of the peripheral or urban form. And I think from my experience in South Africa, um, it's, a, it's a form that's usually actively fought rather than included. I think we've seen even during COVID lockdowns, people's um, houses have been demolished and they've lost their homes um, and i think policy generally excludes rather than includes this form um, and i was wondering if you have any good examples from the global south where government has actually worked with this this urban form rather than against it <laughs> yeah thank you katinka i'm i'm um yeah, no, I, uh, I mean, I, uh, Teresa Caldera is very optimistic, yeah, in her work, she's very optimistic, she shows where you have auto-construction and where you have people, uh, in a sense, appropriating and transforming their own spaces uh, in, with, with examples primarily from, from Latin America. Uh, and when they become wholesale citizens, in a sense, yeah? or not wholesale citizens, but they become, they negotiate both uh, a place in the city, properties for themselves, uh, with title deeds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also uh, a place within the political sphere of the cities. Yeah? 
having also worked mainly in uh, in in Africa, it is it is hard to see good examples of peripheral urbanization that have gone um, that have been positive. And certainly during these last few years in in Mozambique as well, you've had rampant and quite violent transformation of the spaces that we could call peripheral urban in a sense yeah and you've had for instance in in places like uh, i showed you um you've had the shooting through of dirt poor areas with with fortified uh, apartment buildings yeah within actually these poor areas yeah which is the opposite of what she describes in a sense although she does say that over time these become very heterogeneous spaces they're still highly unequal etc 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 so so that's it i mean if you look at some post-colonial countries some post-colonial countries in africa as mozambique for instance had huge experience with with social experiments with social um, social uh, housing and social um, uh, and the and the transformation therefore of urban spaces as well you did in mozambique uh, where state prop where all property is still state property where all have a right to a house uh, where those houses that people built uh, in the 70s and early 80s suddenly in the late 1980s were their own properties yeah they were given their own properties so that worked yeah it was a huge social experiment in a sense so it so you have cases of it but i'm i i would agree with you i'm not as positive as as uh, as, uh, as teresa caldera i think i'm, I'm sorry to say <laughs> it might be might be worth taking a a short break now yes yes yeah. so shall we come back at 10 o'clock